great to see you this morning. I'm not sure what the Lord just said to you, whether you were uh, in a place where you were able to hear his voice speaking to you. Um, you are able to hear his voice. I'm able to hear his voice. Sometimes it's just a matter of learning how to do that because um, he, he, his relationship with us is distinct from any other relationship we will ever have. Uh, you can hear me now by one of your, correct me if I'm wrong, five senses. I've got a wife who's a primary school teacher, so I have to check those kind of details with her. Five senses, and you're hearing me with one of those senses, and you will communicate with your spouse or your friends or even strangers, in fact, uh, through those five senses. But you won't primarily communicate with God, and he won't primarily communicate with you through those five senses. And so we're going to see something of that this morning. But the Lord just said to me, as I... Uh, attuned myself and my spirit to his spirit, the Lord just said to me, I love you. And um, more often than not, he'll say something more complex than that to me, but he'll probably never say anything more profound to me than that he loves me. And I don't know what he said to you this morning. Perhaps it was something more complex than that or something as straightforward as that. How did he say it and how did I hear him? And then we'll get to the, the point. Well, I heard him in my spirit. And so effectively, I didn't hear him because to hear somebody, we're talking about our, our eardrums and our uh, physi uh, the, the physical side to our hearing. But, but there's that sense of being able to know that he's saying something. Some people would call it a thought. The Lord gave me a thought, and the thought was, I love you. And so that was great to hear that from him this morning. And, uh, and it's important that we know how to hear him. We've just heard from two guys, uh, Justin and before that, Eddie, who had a call from God. And, and the way that the Lord spoke to Justin about the, the specific calling that he's just received recently was through a vision. And that will be one way that the Lord can speak, of course. For Eddie, it was far more circumstantial if you listen to his story. It was, for, well, first off, it was the sad, uh, in one respect, uh, experience of his wife dying. But then a perfectly normal telephone conversation from somebody who asked him to go to Africa which wasn't normal, as he said. It was actually God in the mix, stepping in on the situation and giving him a call. And um, Eddie was willing to respond to that. And in response, it was a simple hearing what God was saying. Anyway, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 78 and we'll, we'll come and we'll draw those things in and we'll see how God has been moving this morning and how he's going to move and speak to us through his word. Psalm 78. Uh, we're, we're looking at the call of David, King David this morning, who wasn't always a king, of course, as we'll see in a moment. But um, just before we get to him, I'll just tell you of a time when I received a call from the Lord. Uh, a call in a similar way to Justin, in a similar way to Eddie, and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, because you've received a call from the Lord too, and, and you could perhaps put a date on that or not. I can't honestly put a date to this call, but that's not the important thing. Uh, my youth pastor, who was probably mid to late 30s at the time, shared a message not too dissimilar from what I'm about to share this morning, though in completely different ways and from a completely different scripture. But, um, but the message that he shared was just to us young people, probably 50 of us at the time, was that the Lord had a specific call for every single one of our lives, an individual plan for us. And I'd been raised in church, but I'd never heard that message before. So that blew me away. I hadn't been saved long, probably months. And, uh, and so I went home, and he said, all you need to do is ask the Lord what his call is for you, and the Lord will tell you. He said, you'll have to be patient, you'll have to be still, which is kind of what Lucas was getting us to do this morning, to be still in the presence of God, so that we can hear him. Um, but he said, in your time, and then in God's time, just listen to what he has to say for your life, and allow him to unfold and progressively reveal that plan to you. So I went home in my bedroom in Earls Barton, Northamptonshire, and said, Lord, I'd really like to know what your plan is for me. I've not been a Christian long, but if you've got a plan for me, and so I, I've heard tonight you do, and so I believe that you do, I'd like to know what that plan is. And so there and then, I felt again in my spirit, it wasn't an audible voice of the Lord, though he can do that, but he rarely does. And you probably will never hear his audible voice on earth, and I probably never will either not to rule it out, because as I say, he can and he has done. Uh, but he, in my spirit, he said to me, I'm calling you to be a preacher. I'm calling you to preach the gospel. In effect, he could have said that to any one of us. But it was important to me to hear that. 
And so uh, after that, I prayed and uh, shared that with my youth pastor who got me to share it with our other pastor of the church, Ian Hicks, some of you know him. And so they uh, prayed for me and encouraged me to go off to Bible college and the rest is history. That's where I met Esther and my wife and all the rest of it. But uh, he was actually preaching from Jeremiah 29 verse 11, which many of you know. Uh, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And that's become one of my life verses. Psalm 78 says uh, of David's life, we're we're looking at verse 70 down to 72, because it's a long psalm and we haven't got the time to read it all. But in that psalm, uh, the psalmist is uh, remembering and recalling the history of Israel. And then at the end of the psalm, he comes to David And in verse 70 of Psalm 78, we read this, that the Lord chose David his servant. He took him from the sheep pens, from tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. Um, David literally was a shepherd, is what the psalmist is saying. Uh, He literally shepherded sheep and cared for them. And then finally, in in verse 72, it goes on and says, And David shepherded God's people with integrity of heart and with skillful hands. He led them. Uh, I believe what, in fact, I don't believe, I know that what is true of David in that psalm there is true of you and I this morning. I just want us to briefly look at the truth over your life and over my life from the life of David. The first truth is this, that you and I, we have a calling on our life. I've already sort of uh, unpacked that truth a little for us, but every one of us have a calling on our life. Some of you know what your calling is. Some of you are living in the fruit and the fullness of that calling on your life. I'm guessing there are probably some here this morning who don't know what your calling is. I'm guessing there are possibly some of you who came in this morning not even realising that God had a call for your life. And perhaps you knew and you imagined that God had a call for Lucas's life because he's a, called to be a pastor and so that's important. Uh, or perhaps you thought, well, he must have a call for whoever's preaching this morning because, of course, preaching's important. But the reality is that being a school teacher like my wife is a calling that is just as important as standing up here and preaching or leading a prayer meeting or whatever else it might be. I don't know what your job is. Uh, If we had time, I'd love to go around for you to tell me. But on every occasion, whatever it is you're doing, as long as it's holy and pleasing to the Lord, I could say to you, just the same as I'm able to say to Esther or to Lucas or to myself this morning, Eric, you are a musician and God has called you to be a musician. Or uh, Dave, you are a... Uh, 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 well, we say a bin man, but that's not the, the right term for it anymore, is it? But you know what I'm saying. Dave, you're a bin man, and God has called you to be a bin man. That's okay. That's wonderful. It's a high calling, just as high as being a pastor in a local church. Uh, and you could add your name and your job and your role into that. And uh, if you're married, that's your high calling too. So, there, you know, it's, it's wider than just your employment. Your marriage, your home is your calling. If you're a parent especially, that's a high calling. That's part of your calling. And so you could say to me this morning, well, Stephen, you're a preacher and that's your calling. Yes, it is. But you're also married. And so you're called to husband your wife well. And you would be right to say that. You could also say to me, and also you have a child called Naomi and then you also have a younger child called Caleb. And as their father, you have a high calling to disciple them and to father them in the faith. So you would be right to say all that, and so would I be correct to say all that to you this morning. And God said of David, he chose David his servant. He chose him. Isn't that a wonderful thing to hear this morning, that he chose David, but he also chose you to be here. Lucas opened with that for us today, didn't he? That you're not here by accident. In fact, your whole life is no accident. God said similar things to, well, he said it time and time again, but he said it very clearly to Jeremiah, if you remember, in Jeremiah 1. He said, uh, I, I knew you before you were even formed in the, wo- in the womb. I knew all about you, Jeremiah. And I'd chosen you. I had a call and a plan and a purpose to your being on planet Earth at this moment in time. And what was true of Jeremiah, what was true of David, is just as true of you today. 
that you're not in Warrington by accident, you're not here by chance, you're not a part of Life Church Warrington by accident either, you're not alive in 2014 just because a bunch of atoms came together millions or billions of years ago and, and so the process ended up with you being here today. That didn't even occur anyway. That's no explanation of it. The reality is and the truth of God's word is that you were created, you were chosen before the foundation of the world. God had a plan and a purpose for your life. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us, uh, Paul says, all praise to God the Father. He's moved in praise to God by this truth. He says, all praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ, for he chose us in Christ Jesus before the creation of the world. And what did he choose you to be? Paul tells us, he chose you to be holy and to be blameless in his sight. In other words, to be in the center of his will, in the very uh, bullseye of his plan and his purpose for your life. So you're no accident. You are chosen. We are a chosen people, a, a royal priesthood, uh, uh, Hebrews tells us. We're God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. Isn't it wonderful this morning that the Lord isn't up in heaven scratching his head thinking, wow, it's... It's uh, 15 minutes to 12. These folks are going to be heading out of those doors in a minute. I really need to come up with a, with a hundred different things for these 100 different people to do. I've got to get my head around this pretty quickly. No, the Lord's not in any position such as that. In advance, he planned what our life was to be. And so what's true of David, what's true, true of Jeremiah, what's true of me and Lucas and others is true of you this morning. You are a chosen and a called person in the Lord. Now, that does not mean that you have no role to play in that. God has equipped you. He has given you uh, every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly realms because he wants you to play a part in that. He said that David was his servant. What do servants do? They obey their master's orders. The master dictates to them what they're to do. Then the servants play their part. They didn't come up with the idea of what to do. But the, the master has given them, every, or good master, has given them everything that they need and they require to do what he's asked them to do. And God has given you all that he's, uh, you need to do what he's asked you, but now you are the servant in the situation, and I am the servant. So we have to come before him humbly and say, Lord, you've given me your Holy Spirit. I don't need to ask for anything more. I've got all that you, you require of me, so now I just need to put it into action. And God is looking for his people to put into action his plans in their life. Um, I, don't, I wasn't going to start by telling you who I am or my history, but anyway, I'm married to Esther. I'm Lucas's brother-in-law, son-in-law of Eric here. And, um, and God's calling on my life, like yours too, um, has taken me to strange places, has given me wonderful opportunities and, and experiences that I never would have had. Miraculous things too, which to others may not seem miraculous, but they just are because they're in God's economy, in God's plan. And, uh, and among those things, for Esther and I, it's meant that we've travelled up and down England preaching in different churches. It's meant going to Ireland on numerous occasions to preach. And um, it's meant going to Uganda in Africa, uh, meeting people at Bible College, some from Burkina Faso, so that brought back nice memories to hear this story this morning. Uh, preach well, we've just come back from America, almost three years, not far off, out there, and God leading us there and then leading us back. And all these just miraculous things uh, that, that just bless our life. And your life will be blessed too when, when you know the will of God and, and you obey the will of God and you choose to surrender to his will and say, yes, I want to be holy and blameless. I want to be in the bullseye of your will, God. No longer me calling the shots, no longer me making the decisions, you can do a far better job than me, Lord, so I submit to you. And I don't tell you all that to say that I'm perfect or, or to brag on myself. I'm just glorifying God and saying, these are some of the things that I've seen. And of course, some of them are humorous and fun. And uh, one of the fun things that we experienced that I had out in Uganda um, was that the house in which we stayed, of course, it's a warm climate, it had w window frames, but no windows in them, just bars. And uh, so when we went to sleep at night, or before we went to sleep, but the, the locals said to us, now, just be a little bit aware that there are snakes in the area, and, so you, and there are poisonous spiders. So 
you need to check your bed before you go to sleep at night. Well, we would do that. And every night I would check my bed before getting in. And there wasn't a night when there was any snakes or any spiders in there, glad to say. Um, but one, in the middle of one night, it was pitch black because in Uganda they turn off the power in their nation at night and, and uh, redirect the, the electricity to a neighbouring country to make money. So you can't turn the light on at night in Uganda, you can't use electricity. So it's pitch black and all of a sudden I woke up because I felt something, well I felt, I thought slither across my legs. And um, there were little camp beds that we were on, so high, so it was perfectly possible for it to get up. But um, I woke straight off and came to a start. There were geckos in the building. That was a constant thing, all up on the ceiling, all on the walls. And so I thought, it's either a snake or it's a gecko. I don't know which, and I really have no way of knowing because I can't turn on the light. But um, I thought, I just want to get out of this bedroom. And there was, a, there was a torch that we kept in the center of the house, which I went to get. As I walked to get the torch, that was bad enough, but um, because it was pitch black, I couldn't see a hand in front of me. I was sleeping in the room with an ex-Royal uh, Marine, big, very big guy, and unbeknown to me, he'd gone to the bathroom in the pitch black at the, around the same time as I woke up. So as I was heading to the doorway, he was coming back through the doorway. He was the kind of guy who could kill you with his bare hands. And uh, so we met face to face, but though he could kill me with his bare hands, he screamed like a girl just the same as I did <laughs> in, the, in the pitch black there. And I don't think it was a snake. That I never found one. I suspect it probably was a gecko, but I'll never know. Um, and then in, in America, we had lots of fun things. We would see bears and we would see snakes. The first day I mowed our grass in our rented house, we had three acres because that's America, isn't it? And as I mowed the lawn, a, a black and yellow snake went flying off out of the thick grass, and so uh, I jumped a mile. I saw that one, so I know it was a snake. I ran into the house and told Esther and everything, and, um, but we would see snakes regularly. Uh, snakes, bears, when Eric, who you know, came out to visit us. One night alone, we saw seven bears up on the mountains. It was fantastic stuff, uh, scary at the same time, but all good fun. So God just blesses us with these kind of adventures, and I could go on and on, but I'm not going to for the sake of time. So God has called you. Now, next thing is this that we see from Psalm 78. God is making us and preparing us for what he has in store because he wants us to be, the word would be competency. He wants us to be competent to do all that he's called us to do. And so um, when he first calls you to something, of course you're not the finished article and neither am I. Neither was David. That's why he had all this sin going on in his life. He wasn't perfect. He still needed the grace of God. And so do you and I. Uh, but God is preparing us for the work that he has for us. I still remember the first sermon I preached would have been, I think, 1996, the year I was saved, uh, at the church in Wellingborough. And I remember it because um, it was on Psalm 23, and I wrote it out word for word, uh, verbatim, read it verbatim, and, and I read Psalm 23 at 100 miles per hour, preached my two-page sermon at 200 miles per hour, and within five minutes it, it was all done and dusted. And I'm sure the people loved me for it that night, didn't they? Um, but uh, the pastor afterwards encouraged me, and he said, the very first sermon I preached, I did exactly the same thing. I read the scripture fast, and then I preached my message even faster, and he said, that night, my church, it was in Wales, he said, my church actually got me back up and they got him to preach and read the scripture all over again. So he preached the same message twice, but he was kind enough not to make me do that. But again, my point is, that first sermon, you know, I wouldn't preach like that today. Um, again, not bragging on myself, but you just learn, don't we? We grow in the things that we do. You're a better teacher today or a better typist today, or whatever it might be, because you've done it long enough to mature in what God has called you to do. So don't be discouraged when you first start out in the things of God, um, that things don't go wonderfully well necessarily, that things aren't easy. God never promised it would be easy, but he has equipped us, he has given us his Holy Spirit, and if we're faithful to him, uh, well, he will continue to use us and continue to grow us. If we're faithful in the small things he gives us to do, then he will entrust us with much. He'll give us greater responsibility in the future, but we have to be faithful in the small things. And God didn't appoint David, did he, as a, uh, to be king as a young boy. What God did 
And this is the wonder of what we're learning from Psalm 78. What God did is he gave David a flock of sheep to care for. Well, he could have given him any job to do, to prepare him, but there was great wisdom. Of course there was, because we're talking about God. There was great wisdom in God giving David a flock of uh, literal sheep. Because people, you know this, people are very much like sheep, aren't we? Uh, we, we sometimes grow, go astray. But like sheep, we need to be fed, we need to be cared for, we need to, we need to be tended for and uh, looked after. That's who we are. And so God knew full well that if David could get his head round a flock of sheep and if he was willing to be kind and faithful and diligent with a flock of sheep, he would learn all sorts of lessons which later on in life he would be able to apply as king and shepherd of the people of Israel. That's the point the psalmist is making. And so uh, God appointed David as king eventually because he'd observed this man's heart and his care for sheep, and we know something of his care, don't we? We know that he would uh, protect them from lions and bears and all these different things. He gave David an opportunity to shepherd, and then in verse 72 we read that because of that opportunity, later on, David guided the people of Israel by the skillfulness of his hands. He was no amateur by that time. He was a mature leader because God had given him these early opportunities. And every one of us, if you like, are called to be leaders. You have a calling upon your life, as I've said. And, and a better way of describing that is we are called to be disciple makers. That would be far truer to scripture. And so the, the Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. That's, that commission wasn't only true of the apostles, and it wasn't only true for me, it was true for you and is true for you too. What is a disciple maker? A disciple maker is a leader or a teacher. Again, that's a better word for a disciple maker. We are to teach others, and, and a disciple is a student. So we are, we are both to be teachers and students at the same time. So I teach some people, and they are not my disciples in a way, but they are my learners. They're disciples to Christ, really. But um, at the same time, I'm a disciple too. I'm a learner. Of, through somebody else of the things of God. And so every one of us has that call, and you have that call, to be a disciple maker. And so therefore, God is saying, okay, there's your call, now become competent at doing what I've called you to do. Guide my people by the skillfulness of your hands. And then finally, um, underpinning all this, is character. God is looking for somebody who has a character or a heart like his heart. That's what was said of David. He was a man after God's own heart. I've already told you, he did have his faults. He did have his failings. And so perhaps that's an encouragement to us this morning because many of us write ourselves off in the plans and purposes of God because we say, I'm just simply not good enough to be who and what God has called me to be. But God says, no, I'll use you and I'll sanctify you in the process. He, he says he'll make you more like him the more you serve him. That's how good he is to us. He's not looking for us to be the finished article. He's looking for a willingness and a desire and a surrender on our part to say, Lord, you know I'm not perfect. I can't pull the wool over your eyes, God, but you've called me, and so I'm going to surrender to you, and in the process I want to be more like you. And you'll find, just as I find, that the more you serve him, the more you desire to be like him. The more you serve him, the more you grow to love him. It's Christians who sit on their hands all their life, who struggle with, with discouragement and, and a lack of uh, passion for the Lord. But you watch and observe those who serve God willingly, those who put out chairs and those who make the teas and the coffees, and those who come and set up and pack away, and those who lead in our music and those who sing and those who preach and those who do the children's work. They're the ones who, who have a love and a passion for the Lord. It's no coincidence. Is because they're drawing near to the Lord. They're in the, the centre of his will. And when you're in the centre of his will, you just grow to love him more because you know him more. The more, the, the more you know him, the more you'll love him. And the more you love him and know him, the more you will become like him. The more his character will grow in you. The more he will be in your life and the less you will be. Uh, David was, a, was a, a man like you and I, but... Nonetheless, he was a man after God's own heart, we're told. 
and uh, there are many, too many Christians who preach and pray with power. Uh, they, they teach and train in a way that's entertaining. They serve or they sing with skill, yet their heart is far from God. And that's not God's will. That's not God's plan or intention for you and I. God wants us to have his character because the right word for people like that is hypocrite. That's what they are, sadly. And perhaps some of us have been there, but by God's grace, he's taken us out of that place of hypocrisy, which simply means to wear a mask, to play the part. But often the mask slips, doesn't it, for people like that? And uh, we don't want to be those kind of people who are doing all wonderful things for the Lord, but underneath it all, we're nothing like him. No, God says, I want you to be like me. I want you to be holy and blameless in my sight so that what we do for him flows out of our relationship with him. There are people, aren't there, who look fired up on the outside, but deep down they were just lukewarm. And over time, people realised that. And some people uh, were, were put off from the whole Christianity and church thing simply because they saw a hypocrisy in those people. And, and that's not what God has for us. No, Oswald Chambers said, uh, the famous preacher, he said, don't let your calling take you where your character can't keep you. Uh, we, we must develop a character so that when we know God's calling and when we are becoming more and more competent to do his calling, our character is enough like him to sustain us in it. Otherwise, we simply become those hypocrites and we fall into sin because I can guarantee you this, that as you do the Lord's will, you will come under attack. The devil will take notice. But that's okay if you're close to the Lord. That's okay if you're living for the Lord because greater is he who's in you than he who is in the world. But if the Lord isn't in you and you're trying to do things for God, well, we see that in the New Testament, uh, a group trying to cast out evil spirits who aren't of the Lord, and lo and behold, the devil gets a hold of them and uh, a, a servant of the devil, a demon, gives them a good beating because they had no protection. But uh, you and I can take on the devil, we can take on demons because we're not doing it in our strength. We're not even doing it in our character, our fallen sinful nature. No, we're doing it in God's character. We are becoming like him and so we know his authority when we're living for him. When we're living out his calling, we don't do it in our authority. We do it with his authority and therefore we do it with his power and uh, so he sustains us and keeps us. Some people put a smile on in church and they go home and they watch a violent, sexually explicit, blasphemous movie but not for you and I, no. Some people carry a big Bible, they proudly quote their memory verses but then the rest of they, the week they leave their Bible on the shelf and uh, blow off the dust when it comes round to Sunday again. Some people sing and lead worship in churches. And then they go home and in the car they listen to unwholesome uh, music the rest of their week. But no, that's not for you and I. That's not good enough for the person, the man or the woman of God. Some people preach and pastor, but when nobody's looking they get drunk. Or they look at sinful websites or they go out and commit adultery. It's a sad truth. I wish it weren't true, but you and I both know people... Uh, whether we know them personally or through the internet or whatever, we know people who've lived those kind of dualistic, uh, hypocritical lives. But that's not for you and I, the true people, chosen, called people of God. Peter says, people who are called and chosen servants of God do this as we close. He says they add to their faith goodness. And so you will do this kind of thing because you're called. Those of you who are saved this morning, those of you who are not saved, well, you are called, you have a call, and God has brought you here for this reason this morning, so that you could know his saving power, so that you could start to live his will for your life by receiving Jesus not just as saviour of your sin, which is true, but also Lord and master of your life. Uh, and then you, like us, you will add to your faith goodness, and to that you will add knowledge, put, uh, Peter says, and to that you will add self-control, and to that you'll add perseverance and godliness and mutual affection. And uh, to mutual affection, you will add God's love, Peter says. So there's a start of the kind of characteristics that will be evident in your life. To a lesser or greater degree right now, because you're not me and I'm not you. But as long as you're growing in the Lord, those characteristics will become more and more a part of your life. So... We're just about out of time, but God says he has a calling for you. And God doesn't just say he has a calling for you and he's leaving you to your own devices. No, he says, I have a calling for you and I'm preparing you so that you'll be competent to fulfill and to flourish in my calling. Uh, however, 
He says, you need to develop godly character. How do we do that? Well, uh, we, we spend time with him, don't we? We read his word, we pray, we gather regularly with God's people, we uh, s- seek to be filled with his Holy Spirit by praying in tongues and using our spiritual prayer language. Uh, we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs in our hearts, at home and in the gathering. All those things are causing us to uh, be like him and to be able to see his will flourish and grow in our lives. Let's pray for a moment, shall we? I know that many of you are well aware of God's call for your life, and that's wonderful. But there are probably those of you who, like me, back in 1996, are hearing this truth, possibly for the first time, or not necessarily for the first time, but but the Holy Spirit has brought a revelation uh, with that truth this morning to you personally. So that now you know, yes, God, you have a calling which is unique to me. You know all about me, Lord. And uh, this is no accident. My life is no accident, no chance. And uh, so that for this morning, uh, you're realising that, yes, Lord, you, if you have a calling for me, well, then I'd really like to know what that is. And the Lord desires and the Lord loves to reveal his will to us. And uh, so if that's you and in your heart you say, yeah, Lord, I I didn't really understand that. I didn't really realise that that what I'm doing at Tesco or in that school or uh, for the local council or for whoever it might be, I didn't realise that was your call for my life, Lord. I thought I'd chosen that way. But now I've realised, God, you've put me there for a purpose. And these circumstances are for a reason in my life. And, uh, Lord, I want to live out your calling. I want to know what it is and I want to live it out. All I want to do is pray for you this morning. Uh, And you need to get alone with God, just as my youth pastor encouraged me to do, because he loves to speak to you directly. But nonetheless, I'd like to pray for you that uh, God would work that out in your life. So perhaps, just as we close in prayer, if you sense that this morning, that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you in that way, perhaps you'll just put your hand up in the air and then straight back down for me, and I'll be able to pray for you. And you can, thank you, well done. And you will go home, amen. And you will say, Lord, what is it that you have for me? Thank you, wonderful. Lord, we pray for these brothers and sisters. We love them, and you love them far more than we will ever do. We pray for those who've raised their hand in faith and said, yes, Lord, you have something for me, and I want to know what that is. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, illuminate your plan and your purpose for their life, for this time, Lord God. And there are others, I know, Lord, who who won't have raised their hand for any number of reasons. That's okay. But nonetheless, in their heart, they know that you've spoken to them this morning. You've confirmed to them that you have a calling for their life, a wonderful, glorious calling, and that they know that you are making them and preparing them, and you have prepared them to do your will, and that you are building, and you are growing your character in them as you conform them to the image of your Son. So, Lord, I pray for everyone here today, myself included. We come before your throne boldly, Lord God, worshipping you, adoring you, giving thanks to the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ that you have a plan for our life, that you've saved us, that you've brought us into your kingdom, Lord, uh, from darkness into your wonderful light as we read earlier, Lord God. And we just pray that you would have your will in our life. Lord, we surrender again to you today. We submit to your will, Lord God, even though at times we don't understand it, even though at times it's very much not easy. But God, we love to do your will because in that we know the fullness of your purpose and your heart. And so, Lord, I commit every one of my brothers and sisters to you here this morning. I ask you that you would bless them, Lord, that you would make your will known to them and that they would walk worthy of the calling that is upon their life. We ask it all in Jesus' lovely name. Amen.